what am I doing? And I'll finally get to sleep. I did it for a few months and I didn't notice as big of a difference as I would have liked. I tried Dr. Andrew Huberman's sleep tips and tricks for one month and here's what I learned. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. And before we dive in, a few things about me and my sleep issues. I've had sleep onset insomnia since I was a kid and I cared a lot about sleep. I really obsessed about it. I say in med school and in residency and that's because you're not sleeping that much, you're working a lot of hours. And we even made some videos on the Med School Insiders channel that were very popular. I kind of distilled everything that I learned. But then I learned more from Dr. Andrew Huberman. So I put that to the test. And I tried his routines as closely as possible for a month. Here's what I learned. So number one, the importance of body temperature. I think a lot of us have known for a while that you want to cool your body before sleep. But I didn't know that you need to also warm your body after you wake up. And this really helps dial in your circadian rhythm, right? So cool one to three degrees Fahrenheit before bed and warm one to three degrees Fahrenheit after you wake up. And that can be with things like exercise, as an example. The brain and nervous system and the rest of the body needs to drop by about anywhere from two to three degrees in order to get into your deepest sleep and transition to sleep. So cool is better for falling and staying asleep and sleeping deeply. The increase in body temperature is triggering the release of cortisol from your adrenals, and that's the wake up signal. Before bed, cooling down your body, cooling down your room is gonna be very beneficial. It might cost a few extra dollars in AC, but it's probably worth it for your sleep quality. And I felt so vindicated because I think many of you who have immigrant parents can relate, whereby as a kid, I wanted to turn on the AC because it was too hot to fall asleep at night. And I have sleep onset insomnia, so I was like really just laying in bed, tossing and turning. And parents said, no, open the window, turn on the fan, and like it'll cool down eventually. It doesn't work that well. And uh, now, in my own place, I turn on the AC every night. And so many of these things I've learned from Dr. Huberman they're all interconnected, right? So we know that uh, as your body cools, your pineal gland actually secretes more melatonin. And then if you guys have watched my other content on like CGMs, oops, on this arm here, melatonin actually inhibits the secretion of insulin. So that's why you spike harder if you have junky food late at night. So all this stuff is, is interconnected. I got so much flack from my family and even people that I've dated about keeping the room too cold and then putting blankets on top. So like that makes no sense, just sleep without blankets. Well, there's actually a reason for it. So. If you fall asleep in a cool room and you have one or two blankets on top, you can then modulate your temperature. Because if you're feeling too hot, your, your body temperature is gonna you know, fluctuate throughout the night. If you're feeling too hot at any point in time, you can then put your legs or your arms out from underneath the blankets and then cool because the room is cool. But if you don't have any blankets on, you're kind of just stuck at that temperature. And if you heat up or cool down, you can't modulate it. So yeah, the extra 10 or $20 in electricity bills every month, totally worth it if you prioritize your sleep. That's why some people like it really cold in the room and under a warm blanket, that can be good. Because this temperature oscillation, as your temperature is dropping, that correlates with the, the most sleepy phase of your circadian cycle. Number two is morning sunlight. And this has been the biggest thing I've taken from Dr. Andrew Huberman, and this has helped a lot. So. Again, going back to raising your body temperature uh, as soon as you wake up, he recommends doing this within 30 to 60 minutes from waking, but warm drinks, exercise, and direct sunlight can all help you raise your body temperature. But the more important thing is that you're actually getting that stimulation to your retina and your eyes. You're getting this really bright sunlight that even these lights here are nowhere near as bright as actually being outside with the sun. So the simple behavior I do believe everybody should adopt is to view ideally sunlight for two to 10 minutes every morning upon waking. It triggers the timed release of cortisol into your system, which acts as a wake up signal and will promote wakefulness and the ability to focus throughout the day. It also starts a timer for the onset of melatonin. So by viewing light first thing in the day, you set in motion these two timers, one for wakefulness that starts immediately and one for sleepiness that starts later. Now this bright early morning sunlight exposure it's critical not only for your focus and alertness and feeling woken up, but more importantly, at least for me, is being able to fall asleep that night. Because what would happen is I'd be tossing and turning and I wouldn't be able to fall asleep when I wanted to fall asleep. And getting that early morning sun exposure, that helps set your circadian rhythm so that your body knows, okay, in 16 hours from now, then we're gonna wind down and go to sleep. I do this most days when I'm at home, but when I'm traveling, honestly, I'm not very good at it, something I should work on. And I used to go outside and journal, but I haven't been journaling much. So now I do these like Indian club shoulder exercises because you wanna be out there for like 
five minutes on a bright day and around 10 minutes on a cloudy day. And doing those Indian club exercises take me about three to five minutes to do all the various ones. So that's been working for me quite well. And I'm mindful to do this early in the day when the sun isn't as harsh, because if I do this, if I wake up too late and now it's 9.30, I'm going outside, then, uh, you know, the, the sun in Vegas is brutal and I don't want to cause excess photo aging and skin damage and all that stuff. And, you know, I always put on my SPF in the morning regardless, but we will be talking more about skincare routines in a future video. So subscribe if you haven't already. One thing Huberman says is try to get it at least 80% of the time. He's very like realistic. I love that. He's not too rigid. He doesn't say you do this every single day. He says, hey, 80% of the time, get it done. And if you miss a day, which will happen, then double the exposure. So rather than doing five minutes on a sunny day, do 10 minutes the next day. Number three is lighting at night. And there's actually two things here I wanna talk about. The first is I changed the lighting throughout my home to be red at like 8.30 p.m. And it does two things. Number one is it reminds me to get ready for bed, you know, brush my teeth, shower, all that stuff, because otherwise I'm just gonna stay up way later than I intend. And then number two is red light is much better for your viewing at night because it doesn't disrupt your circadian rhythm. Because remember, we want to avoid bright blue light and dim red light is essentially the opposite. It doesn't stimulate your eyes in the same way and disrupt your circadian rhythm. Now I started doing this in like 2014 or 2015 when I got Philips Hue as a gift and I've since expanded and I have Philips Hue throughout my whole home. And I tried to minimize turning on any bright lights during this time, because again, for me, my big issue is falling asleep. Now this lighting is important leading up to bed because it's going to disrupt your ability to fall asleep. That's what they say, avoid TV and other backlit devices, even your phone, right? Too bright with that blue light. But even in the middle of the night, if you need to go use the restroom, then having that dim red light is gonna allow you to fall back asleep and not be overly stimulated. Now I got this, this hack from Hyatt Regency in Monterey. I stayed there in 2020. And I remember going to the restroom in the middle of the night and underneath the bed, these lights turned on based on my motion. And I was like, that is so cool. So I bought these $20 Philips Hue sensors and also light strips. I put those underneath my bed. It's like programmed with some logic that says, hey, if all the lights are off and it's after like 9 p.m. or something, then for one or two minutes, there'll be a very dim light that turns on, just enough for me to be able to walk to the restroom without hitting things, but not so bright that it actually wakes me up. And that brings me to the second point, which is actually the vertical positioning of the light matters too. So having that light lower, like on the bottom of my bed, or even just in outlets on the wall, having motion detecting night lights that are, you know, like five bucks on Amazon, those are actually better because the way your retina works is things that are lower in your visual field, hit the top of your retina and things that are higher in your visual field hit the bottom of your retina. So in the later parts of the day, you essentially want to minimize the amount of stimulation to the lower part of the retina because that is essentially sensing light from above. So think of like evolutionary times. Essentially, you're getting light from the sun, right? And that's gonna hit the bottom of your retina. That tells you to be awake and alert. You wanna get more of the light to the top of your retina, which means light that is low on the ground. Things like a campfire, again, prehistoric times. So previously, I was focusing so much more on the brightness and the color of the light, but now I'm also focusing on the actual positioning of the light vertically in space. And I also have a lot of night lights throughout the home that are motion-based, so I don't have to turn on the overhead lights. The other cool thing that has encouraged me to watch more sunsets, because I love sunsets, is that actually seeing the sunset and have that low solar angle it helps you in setting your circadian rhythm and helping you wind down for later that evening. Now, even though you need so much bright light in the morning to stimulate alertness and to set your circadian rhythm, you need very little to actually disrupt things in the evening. It's kind of messed up. It's kind of annoying how that works, but this has been so critical and so impactful for my own sleep with sleep onset insomnia. Number four, scheduling your day. This is one where I've taken so many small tidbits from Huberman and implemented them in my life, but they're hard to stick with. And I find myself oftentimes messing things up and like, as an example, after this, I'm gonna to go to the gym really late at night, and then I'm gonna come home and sleep, which is not ideal. You wanna separate your exercise from your sleep by several hours, because now I'm gonna be super stimulated after my workout, and it's gonna be harder for me to fall asleep. But let's start from the beginning of the day. So Huberman recommends waiting 90 to 120 minutes after you wake up before you consume caffeine, because you want to clear more of that adenosine. Because remember, caffeine is a competitive inhibitor of adenosine receptors, and your body is still clearing it in the morning. So by avoiding caffeine for the first 90 to 120 minutes, you're actually reducing the likelihood of having an afternoon crash. Now, here's one thing I found counterintuitive, which is that on days where you lack sleep, Huberman recommends the next day do not rely too heavily on caffeine. Instead, focus on other forms of deep relaxation, like NSDR or napping. The problem for me though, is that I tried that, and even with, with like a short power nap, it messes with my sleep debt, meaning that that night, it's harder for me to fall asleep if I take a nap earlier in the day. So I do rely more on the caffeine. It's not ideal according to Huberman, but that's working for me right now. Another thing I've changed is actually eating early in the day. And the main reason I changed this is that I'm trying to bulk up. Yeah, buddy. 
A lot of us do time-restricted feeding where we eat from like 12 until eight, something like that. We all know that it's, it's actually more beneficial to eat from early in the day and, and stop eating sooner. But most people, myself included, we tend to eat from the afternoon, early afternoon until the early evening because of social reasons, right? A lot of us socialize over dinner and it's a lot easier to say, hey, let me just eat from 12 to eight rather than say, I'm gonna eat from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. But eating earlier in the day actually helps with your circadian rhythm, which is awesome because it increases your body temperature and it also helps increase your metabolism. Now, when it comes to exercise, like I said, you don't wanna exercise within like three or four hours of going to bed. He actually recommends waking up and exercising immediately or waiting three hours or 11 hours. Those are the optimal times to actually exercise. Number five is gonna be the supplements for sleep. And Huberman has three big ones that he's very well known for. One is epigenin, one is L-theanine, and the other is magnesium L-threonate. Now I took these at his recommended doses, 50 mg for epigenin, 100 to 400 milligrams of L-theanine, I did 200, and magnesium L-threonate of 145 milligrams. He says start there and then you can also modulate based on your needs. And I did this actually for more than a month. I did it for a few months and I didn't notice as big of a difference as I would have liked. And I think the reason is that they probably do help, but if other things aren't dialed in, they don't help enough to overcome the other things that are not dialed in. So if I'm not getting that morning sunlight exposure, or if I'm not avoiding exercise three to four hours before bed, or if I'm not being consistent with my wake and sleep time, that's actually the biggest thing. That's the hardest, but the most impactful thing is falling asleep and waking up at consistent times and avoiding staying up four hours later on the weekend and waking up, you know, sleeping in as well on the weekend, because then you're, you're throwing yourself off for the whole next week. But I tried those supplements for actually a couple months and I didn't notice a big change. I noticed a much bigger change from dialing in those larger, bigger habits. The other reason why I stopped them completely is that my AST and ALT were elevated. I had transaminitis, essentially mild liver inflammation. It was still within the normal range, uh, but the normal range is pretty high for liver, like up to like 50 or 55, something like that is considered normal. And I was at the high 40s. And normally for me, I'm low to mid 20s. So that was a bit alarming. And my GI doctor, he's like, well, are you taking supplements? He's like, why don't you try cutting those? That's the most common reason for this. And cut them out. And then my AST ALT went back to the low to mid twenties. Now, last week I tried taking them again, just to experiment. And I actually noticed myself waking up more in the middle of the night when I took those supplements, interestingly. And I didn't notice that big of a difference in terms of falling asleep. It seemed essentially unchanged yet again but I was waking up in the middle of the night more frequently. And that's actually unusual for me. Normally I just sleep through the night. So in addition to these three supplements, there's also THC and CBD, which are helpful with sleep onset because of their anxiety relieving effects. Now marijuana can be helpful for falling asleep for some people. It doesn't actually do anything for your sleep quality. It can actually hinder your sleep quality, but helping you fall asleep, your mileage may vary. So I think I'm just wired super weird because those other supplements that human recommends doesn't really work for me. And then even marijuana, for most people, it puts them to sleep, but for me, it like it activates me, whether it's sativa or indica, and I'll be up late at night researching airplane foil design for maximal lift and minimum drag, and then I'll have like a moment of clarity at 3.30 a.m. and be like, what am I doing? And I'll finally get to sleep, realizing it's not a good use of my time. So yeah, I've tried THC, CBD for sleep. It doesn't work for me. Speaking of being weird and having a unique makeup, I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, Insight Tracker. Everyone has a different biological makeup. So the strategies and the supplements that work for one person may not work for another. Look at me and these sleep supplements as an example. As you guys know, I'm super passionate about taking a data-oriented approach to my health and well-being, and I'm super excited to partner with Insight Tracker, who are at the forefront of data-driven wellness. To truly understand what is happening inside your body, you need to look at your own data. Insight Tracker uses a combination of data from your blood, DNA, and habits to create a snapshot of your health. So I'm weird, and I have this lab test tracker that I manually created an update on Google Spreadsheets. And it has all the labs from all my doctors and various uh, facilities over the years. This is very helpful to then trend data over time, right? I did this before Insight Tracker was a thing. And with Insight Tracker, you don't have to do this painstaking process because they actually track those things for you and give you your, your trends over time and they give you recommendations. So especially if you're not a medical professional and you're not trained in deciphering what some of these labs may mean, Insight Tracker is super useful. So the first thing here on my dashboard, it tells me my inner age. So I'm 32 years old, almost 33. And it says my inner age based on my various markers is 25.7. So I'm getting some encouragement here saying, hey, my behaviors and my labs are looking good for the most part. And then they have my biomarkers here. Most things are really good. Some things need improvement and I'm at risk in three of those 
fire markers. So I can scroll through, and then as a guy, a lot of us care about testosterone, I can then click in, and it'll tell me more about what this test means, and I can compare myself to other people in my age range, and it gives me actionable advice as well. The cool thing is that they'll actually send someone straight to your home to actually do the blood draw, which is incredibly convenient. And I wish I knew about Inside Tracker sooner because what I did is I pay an arm and a leg for a concierge physician here in Las Vegas to then get these labs drawn because I want my labs drawn at a more regular interval and at a higher frequency than what most non-concierge doctors are comfortable doing. But with Inside Tracker, it's a whole lot more convenient. They give you this great dashboard that allows you to trend your data so you don't have to create your own Google spreadsheet and also has some actionable tips for you. And arguably, most importantly, it's not nearly as expensive as going some alternate routes. Click the link in the description to learn more about Insight Tracker, and by doing so, you're helping support the channel. Thank you. And finally, number six, time zone changes and late nights. As much as we wanna be super consistent and regimented with our sleep, that's just not reality, life doesn't work that way. So every December, I go duck hunting with one of my old med school buddies, and we have to wake up at like, 4 or 5 a.m. And after that, my sleep is always dialed in. And it happens every year. So even this year, like from December up until maybe April, I was sleeping at 10, maybe 11 p.m. most nights and waking up at like 6 or 7 a.m. Felt great, it was awesome. Then I went on a trip, had a few late nights, and that threw things out of whack. And then more recently, I had a, a nasty ear infection. And same thing, like just a few nights of bad sleep can throw me completely off and it's so hard for me to get back on track. So a few things that I've learned, number one is that you know, naps work for some people, they just don't work for me. And I know that Huberman loves NSDR and it might work for you, definitely try it out. For me, it doesn't work. So if I nap, I am not falling asleep that night. And even if it's a short nap, even if it's a power nap, like a 13, 15 minute nap, um, that used to work for me. And I made videos on the Med School Insider channel about how to nap most effectively. Those used to work for me because I was always sleep deprived. So even if you nap for 15 minutes and you're sleep deprived, it's okay because you're still gonna be tired at night because you only got like five hours the night before. But nowadays I'm prioritizing sleep, so I sleep seven, eight hours most nights, not every night, and therefore a nap is more disruptive. Now the tricky thing here is that I'll feel super tired if I didn't sleep well the night before. And I'll be like, oh, you know, let me just get my laptop, let me go home, sit on the couch, do some work. That's dangerous, don't do that, because next thing you know, you're falling asleep, and then you take a 30 minute nap, and now you're messed for the whole night. So I use things like my posture and exercise to resist the urge to nap during the day. So if I'm feeling tired and I can't focus on my work, I will go hit the gym because once my body starts moving, that tiredness, it disappears and you feel back to normal. Same thing with working at my desk. I'm sitting upright in my chair or I actually put my desk to the standing height and now all of a sudden, I'm not nearly as tired. So it's not just taking the action that you're motivated to do, but it's also doing the action that then motivates you more, if that makes sense. So if you're tired, do the action anyways and then you'll no longer feel as tired. Then when it comes to travel and changing time zones, Huberman has some great advice when it comes to those various circadian rhythm modulating behaviors like body temperature and light and things like that and how it relates to your your uh, temperature minimum two hours before you wake up so if you're consistently waking up at let's say 6 a.m then your temperature minimum will occur at 4 a.m and then those behaviors before or after that temperature minimum will influence how your circadian rhythm shifts the coldest period of that 24-hour cycle is when you are going to be sleepiest there's actually a period within that 24 hour cycle. It's a, it's a time point called your temperature minimum and your temperature minimum tends to be about two hours before your typical wake up time. Now I am going to be trying this when I travel to India early next year, but what I will say has worked for me very well in the past is that since falling asleep is more my issue, but staying up longer is usually not an issue. What I have always done is I just kind of suck it up for a day or two and I just force myself to stay up as long as possible until I can fall asleep at a reasonable hour in that new time zone. And then within a day, I'm like, I'm good. When I was younger, I thought that me and my family that we were forever just night owls. And all of us stayed up super late and would wake up pretty late. Or we would force ourselves to wake up early and just not sleep that much the, the night before. And it wasn't until med school that I challenged that identity because I needed to wake up at like 3 a.m. for certain rotations and I would then fall asleep at 8 or 9 p.m. And it wasn't easy initially, but then once I got adjusted to it, I realized that I'm not actually a night owl. It's just that because of TV, because of various habits, because of light exposure, bright lights late at night, it became easier and easier to just stay up late. But challenge your identities. Don't think that you're fixed in a certain way because I found it actually enjoyable to sleep early and wake up early. And I was so productive and waking up at 3 a.m., 
By the time most people were starting their days, I had already accomplished so much and it felt so good. So if you think that you're doomed and that you're forever gonna have a terrible relationship with sleep, then I urge you to challenge that belief and check out this video up here called How to Wake Up Early and Not Be Miserable. It's the key insights I learned that have helped me so much over the years and I hope you find it equally useful. Much love my friends, see you there.